Hi Nint, how are you? Hmm, I just need to set my two monitors up. And also put on some music. Okay. I'm really enjoying the Civ 6 soundtrack. Are there really like 300 songs? And it says, I'm good. I haven't watched your streams in a while. Yeah, I'm curious how your Latin has progressed. Um, not much, to be honest. Why? Why am I back on the first page? I don't remember where I was. It usually saves this. Okay, but my notes are saved, it's just that uh, I lost the page. It's annoying. I think it was in this chapter, yeah. Okay. I stopped here. Cool. Ceterum senseo Cartaginem delendam est, quid tibi videtur. Cool! Um, Iulia, eke rosa, nonne pulcra est haec, haec rosa. I don't. I haven't seen this word before. So let's learn a new word. Yay! Or maybe it's just a different. Uh, yeah, it's a different. Um, declination, maybe. Because I do remember hick. So this music is loud. It is more like it. So it's just a uh, feminine, for here. A key. I'm pretty sure you had a key. And it's like, I don't know, I don't want to risk, I guess. Yeah, here's a look. So this is... What? Did you really just jump? 
a bunch of pages. Why? Okay, what page am I on? This doesn't even say it. Let's hope it doesn't keep jumping pages. So, uh, look at the rows. Non e pulcra est hic rosa. Non e. So is it like, is it not beautiful? Sure, but what is the exact, uh, what's going on exactly here? Was ne the, the question particle? I think so. So is it not beautiful? This is to be beautiful and here. So isn't this rose here beautiful? Julius. This. So heck is this? Not here? Sure, that makes more sense. Haik rosa equals rosa que hic apud me est. So the rose that is here with me. So it's like this, not that. Sure. Julius. Nulla rosa tempulcra est quam filia mea. Uh, no rose is as beautiful as my daughter. Uh, and it says non e equals natus in a question. Yeah, that's what I said. Here, isn't it beautiful? Non e is used when the question will be answered with yes. Yeah, that's what I said. Julius filie sue osculum dat. So Julius gives his daughter a kiss. Yamne lacrimat Julia. Yamne so is the the question particle. I think yam is one of the useless words. Um, like now and now, so now. This music does not fit. Um, Yamne lacrimat Yulia. So this is Yulia cries. So yeah, I'm pretty sure Yam is one of the four, maybe the words that don't mean much yeah I'm already now anymore okay so it's now uh, now does Yulia cry it doesn't you know because it's wait none is the question so it's just does Yulia cry now Emo leta est it ridet. I don't remember emo. Let me check that. Maybe I haven't seen this before. Nope, I've searched for it. No, indeed, by no means. On the contrary, nay. There was one word that I wanted to add here. Hick. I do think I have hick, so I just add with that. Okay, hick, hick, 
which can be here or it can be this here. Um, where was I? Emo. So on the contrary, she's happy and laughs. Hey can also mean here or this thing here. Yeah. Isn't this road here beautiful? Yeah. Sure. That's exactly what I was saying. Julia, num nasus meus fuedus est? So Julia asks, isn't my nose ugly? Julius, fuedus imo tam formosus est quam uh, ugly? On the contrary, it's as beautiful as hoc malum. Why does he stop here? Hoc malum is a to malum quod hic apud me est hic haec hoc hic sacus haec rosa hoc malum so this is still these are here so malum is the apple so he he stops and he says you're on the contrary it's as beautiful as the apple eki malum tum julia the apple is yours julia pater filie malum magnum et formosum dat the father gives the daughter Uh, a build a big and beautiful apple Julia Malum Terget et ante oculus tenet What is ter Terget again? Have I added the emo here? Yeah. And Tergit? I have not. Oh, I have added Tergit, which is clear. So, she clears? The apple? Or because they, they were, she was usually clearing, like clearing or cleaning or rubbing her nose or her eyes so but here it's the apple which is kind of odd but yeah she rubs the apple and uh, and uh, holds it in front of her eyes You don't know the history is the golden apple that was given to the most beautiful goddess. Uh, cool. Julia. Oh. Quam formosum est hoc malum. Oh, how beautiful is this apple. Puella leta malo suo osculum dat. Uh, the girl happy uh, gives her apple a kiss. Julius, hoc pirum etiam tuum est Julia. Uh, despair tuum est is yours. I forgot. Etiam wasn't etiam, but it was said 
and uh, there was another word for but also is etiam so despair is also yours Julia Julius a pirum that Julius gives her a pair yum puella et malum et pirum habet now the girl has an apple and a pear. Emilia. Etiam Anchilis meis. Mala et pirada. Uh, etiam was also. Anchilis is the female slaves. Meis could be mine. mine belonging to me uh, so Emilia is saying also give my slaves a pear and an apple Julius Anchilas ad se vocat it is quoque mala et piradat so Julius turns to the slaves and Quoque uh, Also, it's the same as it, I'm sure And also gives them an apple and a Pair. Ankele lete ex atrio exeunt. So the happy slaves exit to the atrium or go to the atrium. I'm pretty sure exeunt is to leave, but I'm gonna have to check that. Could be wrong. I don't actually have that, so I can add it to my list of words. Exio to go out, yep. Do I have Exio maybe? Nope. So Exio. Oops. Exio, Exio. Exit, leave. Cui Julius malum dat? Puero malum dat. Puer cui Julius malum dat est filius eius. I forgot cui. I always forget the small words. I think it's who. Who's for Cuius? And here we have Cui, which is probably just the same thing. Who for Cui? And Cui is just a declination. Okay. So who does Julius give an apple to, supposedly? Puero malum dat. Puero is boy. So he gives the apple to the boy. Puer cui Julius malum dat est filius eius. The kid who Julius gives an apple is his son. Cui Julius osculum dat. Who does Julius give a kiss to? Puele osculum dat. 
uh, the girl he gives a kiss to. Puella qui Iulius osculundat filia eius est. The girl who Iulius gives the kiss to is her his daughter. Grammatica Latina. Hmm, I'm gonna do this next time. Plutarch, Life of Cicero. Cicero then went to fetch the conspirators and the members of the Senate with, went with him. This is some repetitive music. Not a fan of the America soundtrack for Civil Sex. The conspirators were not all in the same place. They had been distributed for safekeeping among the praetors. First he called for Lentulus from the Palatine Hill and led him down the sacred way through the middle of the forum. The most eminent statesmen formed up in ranks and acted as a bodyguard, but the people shuddered at what was being done and passed along in silence, especially the young looked as though they were being initiated with fear and trembling into the sacred rites and mysteries of some time-honored process of aristocratic power. Cicero crossed the forum to the prison and then delivered Lentulus to the public executioner with orders that he should be put to death. Next was the turn of Cethegus, and so he brought down all the rest in order and had them executed. He observed that there was that there were still standing about in bands in the forum many people who were in the conspiracy and who, not knowing what he had done, what ha had been done, were waiting for nightfall with the idea that their leaders were still alive and could be rescued. 
to this, Cicero shouted out in a loud voice. They have lived their lives. This was in a, in a single word in Latin, like viverunt, I believe. This being the Roman way of indicating death without using the ill omen word. It was now evening and Cicero went up through the forum to his house. There was no longer the usual silence and regular order in the crowds of citizens who escorted him there. Wherever he passed, people shouted aloud and clapped their hands, calling him the savior and the founder of his country. The streets were brightly lighted since people had put lamps and torches in their doorways. The women also showed lights from the roofs of the houses in his honor and so that they might see him going up in this splendid procession with the greatest men in Rome escorting him. Most of these had been the victors in famous campaigns, had entered the city in triumph and had added great areas of land and sea to the Roman dominions. But now, as they walked in this procession, they acknowledged to each other that the Roman people owed thanks to many commanders and generals of the times of the time for riches and spoils and power, but for the safety and security of the whole, their thanks were due to Cicero and to Cicero alone who had delivered them from this great and terrible danger. What seemed so wonderful was not so much the fact that he had put a stop to the conspiracy and punished the conspirators, as that he had succeeded in crushing this greatest of all revolutions by such comparatively, comparatively painless methods with no disturbances and no civil strife. For most of those who had flocked to join Catalan deserted him and went off as soon as they heard what had happened to Lentulus and Cethegus. And when Catalan, with what was left of his forces, joined battle with Antonius, both he and his army were destroyed. There were, nevertheless, some people who were prepared both in speech and action to attack Cicero for what he had done. Their leaders, among those who were to take up office as magistrates next year, were Caesar, who was to be praetor, and Metellus and Bestia, who were to be tribunes. Cicero still had a few days of his consulship left when they came into office, and they refused to allow him to address the people. They sat down on their benches in front of the rostra and gave him no chance or opportunity to speak, merely telling him that he could, if he wished, just pronounce the oath traditionally taken on living office and then come down again from the rostra. Cicero accepted their conditions and came forward to take the oath. When he had obtained silence, he pronounced instead of the usual form of words a new oath of his own. I swear, he said, in very truth that I have saved my country and maintained her supremacy. And all the people assented to the oath and confirmed it with him. This made Caesar and the tribunes all the more angry and they tried to put fresh difficulties in Cicero's path. Among these efforts of theirs was a, a law which they proposed for the recall of Pompey and his army in order. So that the, so they said to, uh, sorry, in order so they said to put an end to the tyranny of Cicero. Here Cato, who was tribune at the time, was a great help to Cicero and to the whole state. While his authority was the same as that of the other tribunes, his reputation was a very much better one, 
and in opposing these measures of theirs, he easily put a stop to their fur further designs. In a speech which he made, he made to the people, he so glorified Cicero's consulship that they voted him the greatest honors that had ever been conferred and called him the father of the fatherland. Cicero was the first, it seems, to receive this title, and Cato gave it to him in his speech before the people. At this time, then, sorry. Cicero was the most powerful man in Rome. However, he made himself obnoxious to a number of people, not because of anything which he did wrong, but because people grew tired of hearing him continually praising himself and magnifying his achievements. One could attend neither the Senate nor a public meeting nor a session of the law courts without having to listen to endless repetitions of the story of Catalan and Lentulus. He went on to fill his books and writings with these praises of himself and made his style of speaking, which was in itself so very pleasant and so exceedingly charming, boring and tedious to listen to since this unpleasing habit of his clung to him like fate. Nevertheless, it must be said that although he was so unreservedly fond of his own glory, he was quite free from envy of other people. He was, as can be seen from his, his writings, most liberal in praises both of his predecessors and his contemporaries. Many such sayings of his are still remembered. For instance, he said of Aristotle that he was a river of flowing gold, and of the dialogues of Plato that, if it were in the nature of Jupiter to converse in human words, this would be how he would do it. He used to call Theophrastus his own special luxury, and when he was asked which speech of Demosthenes he considered the best, he replied, the longest one. Yet some of those who try to copy Demosthenes themselves are apt to do dwell on a remark which Cicero makes in a letter to one of his friends to the effect that there are parts of the speeches where Demosthenes seems to be falling asleep. They fail to mention the fact that Cicero constantly praises Demosthenes in the most wholehearted and wonderful way, or that he gave the title of Philippics to those speeches of his own, the ones against Anthony, to which he devoted more attention than to any others. And as for the distinguished speakers and scholars of his own time, they all, without exception, had their fame increased by what Cicero wrote or said in praise of them. When Caesar was in power, he obtained from him the Roman citizenship for Credipus the Peripathetic, and he got the counsel of the Areopagus to pass a decree requesting him to stay in Athens as a teacher for the young man and as an ornament to the city. There are also letters from Cicero to Herodes and others to his son, in which he recommends them to study philosophy with Credipus. On the other hand, he blames Gorgias, the rhetorician, for leading the young man into luxurious ways and heavy drinking, and therefore forbids his son to keep company with him. This is almost the only one of his Greek letters there is one other addressed to Pelops of Byzantium, which seems to have been written in anger. As for Gorgias, the harsh words are fully justified. If he was the worthless and dissolute character that he is supposed to have been, 
But in the case of Pelops, Cicero shows rather a mean spirit, writing Querulous. Oh, Querulous. Jesus, sorry. Querulously to complain that Pelops has not taken enough trouble about getting honorary decrees passed for him by the people of Byzantium. This kind of thing was characteristic of his love for praise, as was the fact that his ability to put things cleverly would often lead him to forget good manners. For instance, he once defended, uh, defended Munatius in court, and Munatius was new, no sooner acquitted than he prosecuted Sabinus, a friend of Cicero's. It is said that Cicero was so infuriated at this that he exclaimed, Did you imagine, Munatius, that you were acquitted on your, on your merits? Let me tell you that it was I who produced the necessary darkness in the court to prevent your guilt from being visible to everyone. Then he once made a public speech from the Rostra in praise of Marcus Crassus and got much applause for it. A day or two later he made another speech attacking him violently and Crassus said were you not standing there yourself and praising me only a few days ago? To which Cicero replied, Yes, I was. It is good practice in oratory to make a speech on a bad subject. On another occasion, Crassus first said that no Crassus had ever lived in Rome to be older than the age of 60, and then attempted to deny it. What can I have been thinking of? he exclaimed, to have said that. You knew, said Cicero, that the Romans would be pleased to hear it and you were trying to make yourself popular. And when Crassus expressed approval of the Stoic doctrine, the good man is always rich, Cicero said. Are you sure that you don't mean their, do their doctrine? All things belong to the wise. Crassus, having the reputation of being too, being much too fond of money. Then Crassus had a son who was thought to resemble a man called Exius, meaning worthy, and as a result there was a certain amount of scandal connecting his mother with this Exius. Crassus' son once made a speech in the Senate which was well thought of, and when Cicero was asked his opinion of the speaker, he replied, Worthy to be the work of Crassus. When Crassus was about to set out for Syria, he wanted Cicero to be his friend rather than his enemy and said to him in a friendly way that he would like to dine with him. Cicero was glad enough to ask him to his house, but a few days later, when some friends were interceding with him on behalf of Vatinius and saying that he genuinely desired to be reconciled with Cicero and to become his friend, he was an enemy of his, Cicero replied, Surely Vatinius doesn't want to have dinner with me too.
so much for the way in which he behaved toward Crassus. Vatinius himself had swellings on his neck and once, when he was speaking in the courts, Cicero referred to him as a tumid orator. On another occasion, Cicero was informed that, wow, surprisingly, surprising how this translated well. On another occasion, Cicero was informed that Vatinius was dead and then shortly afterward learned for a certain that he was alive. Bad luck to the man, said Cicero, who told the lie. Then, at the time when Caesar had a decree passed for distribu distributing the land in Campania among his soldiers, many of the senators were op strongly opposed to it, and Lucius Gellius, who was about the oldest of them, declared that so long as he lived, it should never be done. Let us wait then, said Cicero, since Gellius does not ask us to postpone things for long. There was also a man called Octavius who was suspected of being of African descent. This is just Cicero quotes. There was also a man called Octavius who was suspected of being of African descent. In the course of a lawsuit, this man said that he was unable to hear what Cicero was saying, and Cicero replied, that's odd, considering that your ears have been pierced. Okay, sure. And when Metellus Nepos declared that Cicero had ruined more people as a witness than he had ever saved as a counsel for the defense. Yes, said Cicero, I admit that you can have more complete confidence in my word than in my eloquence. Then, there was a young man who was suspected of having given a poison cake to his father. This young man put on a very bold air and said that he proposed to give Cicero a bit of his mind. I would much prefer it, said Cicero, to a bit of your cake. There was Publius Sextius, too, who in a lawsuit had engaged Cicero and others as well for his defense, but who insisted in doing all the speaking himself without allowing anyone else to say a word. When it was quite clear that the jury were going to acquit him, and while the vote was actually being taken, Cicero said to him, make the most of your opportunities today, Sextius, tomorrow you are going to be a nobody. Oh, okay, we're almost over. Then there was Publius Consta, who wanted to be a lawyer, but was lacking both in learning and in ability. He was summoned by Cicero as a witness in a lawsuit and kept on saying that he knew nothing. Perhaps, said Cicero, you are under the impression that you are being examined on points of law. There was an occasion, too, when, when in a quarrel with Cicero, Medalus Nepus asked him repeatedly, Who is your father? I can scarcely ask you the same question, Cicero replied, since your mother has made it rather a difficult one to answer. Nepus' mother, being a lady whose reputation for chastity was not high. Nepus himself also was of a flighty disposition. He once suddenly deserted his office as tribune, and sailed off to P Pompey in Syria, and then, with even less reason, came straight back again. He gave his teacher Philagrus a funeral which was more elaborate than necessary and set up on his tomb the figure of a raven in stone. Cicero's comment was, how appropriate, since instead of teaching you to speak, he taught you how to fly from one place to another. Then there was Marcus Appius, who opened his speech 
in a lawsuit by saying that his friend had begged him to show care, eloquence and integrity. And how can you be so hard hearted, said Cicero, as not to exhibit a single one of these qualities which your friend demanded of you? Okay, that's all for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.